Welcome to the Flower Essence Podcast and join us on an exploration of the healing wisdom of flowers. With combined decades of experience in the study and practice of flower essence therapy, I, Kathleen Aspens, and co-host Rokana Feld guide you to reconnect to nature with these potent vibrational remedies. Kathleen Aspens, and I'm here with Rokana Feld. Today, we're going to be talking about the season of fall. It's a surprisingly challenging season for many people because it brings up emotions of grief, loss, and change. It's in the nature of the season to have these feelings and to experience them deeply. Fall is a season that we associate with going back to school as well. So there are elements of change and moving into new places and losing the old parts of ourselves and then moving into new types of being There are many flower essences that can help support us in fall. So let's get started, Ro. Hi, Kathleen. It's great to be here as always. And we are smack dab in the middle or really technically at the beginning of fall because um, the autumn equinox just happened yesterday in the Northern Hemisphere. This is a time when the sun moves from the astrological sign of Virgo to Libra and starts to seek balance. And some of the themes about this time, especially in the wheel of the year, which is a term used for the seasons and how they were celebrated uh, in ancient cultures all over the world. And in modern times, various, um, you know, pagan groups, uh, have tried to sort of recreate what we think that, you know, our, our ancient ancestors took part in when it came to celebrating the seasons and the cycles of the year. And with fall, it's a time that is ruled by the direction of the West and the element of water. There are themes of slowing down, of looking within, letting go of old stuff no longer needed, and we, and in that we start to make decisions about what we want to keep, what we want to harvest, and we want to prepare for winter. So it's getting back into balance from that big outward energy of the summer and getting ready for the going inward of winter. And we're sort of in, be, in that in-between place. The, the light starts to change and it starts to trigger our body for for going deeper within. I think about the fall from these Chinese medicine angles. And the really interesting piece is is that at the equinox in the Chinese medicine conception of seasons, that's actually middle of fall. (laughs) So it's not the fall beginning. And I think that that for me, it's really obvious that we we fall started some time ago that if you notice, if you're paying attention, the light started to shift like a month ago in where in the area where we are in Northern California. And it becomes really clear that things are preparing for a change. And now we're definitely in the middle of it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, um, with the animals, they all start shifting their coats. The horses started shifting their coats, you know, a good month ago. The dogs are shedding like crazy at my house. <laughs> And the parrots and the birds, um, this is when we find a lot of feathers because the birds are starting to create new uh, feathers for the winter. And so if you go walking out in nature, you'll find feathers of different birds um, dropping. Uh, And so that's kind of part of this whole concept of fall of letting go of this whole season that we had before us, the whole summer of that expansion and growth and deciding what we let go of, deciding what to release and let recycle. Yeah, and it's so interesting here in Northern California because right now we're having, you know, it, we have this hot late summer, but also the fall did start. I mean, we, you know, the oaks, the oak trees around me started, the leaves started getting brown about a month ago. I mean, those are usually the first trees around here to start losing their leaves. And there's, you know, there's leaves everywhere around me. Um, but at the same time, we have these heat waves and it's going to be in the 90s today and then it'll shift back down to the 50s 
tonight. So there's these wide swings of temperature as the season's like trying to shift, but it's like the summer doesn't want to let go <laughs> in the, and then, then it's dry, you know, and it won't rain for a while. So I just, the, the Northern California or the, you know, the, the, the energy of the season is I always find really interesting. And I look, you know, I have this feeling of really looking forward to the weather getting cooler when we have these dry heat waves, especially with the, you know, the tension and anxiety of fire season upon us. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really a, um, a challenging season. The, the spring and the fall are both considered to be really challenging seasons physically because in the fall, the energy has, has switched and it's now instead of going up and out with the summertime, that expansive energy, the, the tide changed. And so now the energies are, are going in and sinking down. And when we have these heat waves, when we have this kind of more extreme weather, it's actually bringing it more into our body. So it impacts us more negatively than it might have if, if it was the same temperature, if it was the same everything, you know, a month or two months ago. So it's, it tends to flare a lot of situations for people if they have inflammatory conditions in their lungs or other things like that, they tend to flare up at this time of year. Yeah, I totally agree and, and see that a lot. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the big challenges of fall that we talked about quite recently, we did an episode on grief. And I think that that's a really worthwhile thing to think about this time of year that we've hit the equinox and we are really looking at fall in its most intense stages um, because it really does bring up a lot of experiences of grief for a lot of us. So if you're interested in that topic, we did cover it pretty well with a lot of different um, essences and different pieces and different mindsets on what might be useful for helping you with, with grief. And then we can talk about kind of a broader picture of what we can do for ourselves this season, which is that process of adapting to change. You know, a, nobody really loves change. <laughs> it doesn't tend to be super popular because it's always a little stressful because you're walking into territory that you don't really know where your feet are. You don't know what's going on and letting go of things can be really, really tough. So if it's a kid, you know, moving from one type of school to the next, that's pretty stressful. Um, you can also just have issues of, of recognizing that what was working for your summer, for your schedule, isn't going to be working now. And you need to change the whole premise of the way you set up your work or your life schedule. And it, now's a really good time to, to make those sorts of changes. Do you have some thoughts on adapting to change? Yeah. And I, and I like to look to nature to give us clues and wisdom for how to deal with the changes that fall brings or changes in general. And grouping the, for example, the deciduous trees together. So the trees that lose their leaves are showing us how to let go of things. And oak is such a great example. And we've talked about oak several times in previous podcasts. So there's some of the oaks that are, are deciduous uh, in this area are like the black oak and the white oak. Um, there's other deciduous trees around here, the big leaf maple. And the oaks we've talked about how much they support life, you know, especially throughout the spring and summer, they have these ecosystems that uh, support all of this, you know, animal and insect life. And they start creating massive amounts of acorns. So they're, you know, feeding droves of squirrels and <laughs> um, humans that would like to collect them and process those acorns. But as it's doing so, it starts, the leaves start to get brown and, and dry up and fall to the ground. And I, I feel that it's showing, showing us that we can share our abundance and then let go of what no longer serves us. So we can prepare to rest and have a resting period, period before giving, um, giving ourselves, uh, a, you know, too much again. So we have that sense of balance. It's telling us that we can certainly create all of this abundance and share it and support people and support ourselves. But 
you know, we also have to rest and we can, we can just let ourselves do that. And, and then when those leaves fall down, it's, it's really, it's not a death. It's the leaf is just moving from the tree to the ground. You know, it's just, it's just changing its place in the environment. Um, so it's just part of nature's cycle. And the other thing I wanted to mention about oak is that it's the way it provides shade in the summer, but once it's bare in the winter, then it lets the light in. So it's really, again, providing a nice uh, balance for what's needed in the entire environment. So that when we, what we learn from this is that um, when we adapt to changes, it's not just for our own self-preservation, but it's a way to be in balance with the whole system. I think oaks are really great teachers for helping us to recognize our place in, in the ecosystem, um, our place in the world. There's a really fascinating book I read not too long ago, ago called Oak, the Frame of Civilization. And it talks about the a theory that humans and human civilizations all developed in areas that grow oaks, that are habitable to oaks. And this author's premise was much more that that humans developed around oaks rather than that our culture developed around agriculture and the, the cultivation of grain. What he was he says is that it's much more about that humans have always lived on oak. It's a great nourishment. It's a great um, uh, food stuff. And also it's a, a, a way that you can build with the wood and, and all of these pieces. So it's it's kind of an interesting book that talks it's all about oaks and all about our historical uh, interactions with oaks all the way through um, through his, the historical record. It's kind of interesting. Wow, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, so you'll post that uh, book in the show notes, I hope. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. Adding I to my list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, our lists always grow. Um, uh, another one that I really like to think about for this premise of change and letting go is walnut. Uh, and I know that we've talked about walnut before. Dr. Bach made the English walnut. And it's, you know, he his word, keywords for it were that it's the link breaker. And that's really what we're talking about is we're talking about, you know, altering previous patterns, altering previous um, systems and ways of doing things in favor of something different. And a lot of times something has to be released in order for us to create something different. So the, the oak, or, sorry, the walnut really helps you to allow that shift and allow that change so that you can start thinking towards something new. Yeah. I love the walnut and uh, how it does help with that reprogramming. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that another essence that we might think about, and this might even be a piece of what you were talking about earlier with that, that elemental attribution of water, which is different than the Chinese medicine attribution of fall being of, of an air, more of an air or metal element. So it's, it's interesting how, but there, I'm sure there's quite a lot of overlap in if we kind of got right down to it. But I think rock water, one of Dr. Bach's essences, is another one that really helps with that piece of, of releasing. Uh, it helps with that piece of, of when we hold on to the way things should be or the way that we believe things are, it prevents us be, from being able to flow with how things actually are. So we tend to kind of grip down and hold down really tight. And rock water can kind of restore us in that flow of what really life is. And we, we really can't fight it. You can't fight the tide. You can't fight water. Water will go right through your hands. It's very flexible and flowing. I think rock water is a, a good essence to think about this time of year. Yeah. Another, another one along that line is the California mugwort, the Artemisia douglasiana. And she teaches us a similar message that um, helps us to understand, accept, and gain strength from natural cycles and to go with the flow and has that water energy. Um, that plant in the wild likes to grow along creek beds around here. And the nature of mugwort, it's sort of a moon plant and follows that rhythm of the earth and the moon energy. And then mugwort also helps to clear obstacles and release old stuff that no longer serves us. 
the way mugwort does that is by pulling it down and out of our body. It's got an energy of sort of pulling down. And you can see that in the herbal action, it helps uh, bring on the menses uh, herbally and really has that feeling of just pulling, pulling down. Um, but also because of the moon aspect, um, it heightens the senses and expands perception and people use it in dream work and visioning. So I, you know, as part of the Art Artemisia family, uh, there's a few that I like um, for the subject and they, the Artemisias in general, I think they all have this quality of kind of going deeper into the psyche to do this processing. What do you think about that? I know that you work with some Artemisias as well. Yeah. I think that they have a natural um, relevance to the season because a lot of them are blooming now or kind of in, in their peak in the drier season. Uh, I know that the Moxa is blooming now um, and the Artemisia that I've made, the Artemisia momiame, um, is blooming now. And so I think that there's a kind of a natural affinity with end of summer, fall. So I think that that's a good starting point. If you're thinking about flower essences, what, what is really in its prime in a certain season or what is really doing its thing, whatever that thing might be um, in, in the season of fall. And Artemisias have they're really powerful medicinals, right? That's it's something that that wherever they grow, they're used medicinally, herbally um, in the cultures wherever they're growing. And so they're very powerful plants. And I, the Artemisia that I use the most um, from my Flora of Asia line, I think that the keywords that I use for it are for your inner child's temper tantrums. Because that piece that we just, when we just won't accept how things are <laughs> and we kind of stomp our feet and I had a plan and this is how it was supposed to be. Artemisia kind of goes, yeah, well, that's not how it actually is. So maybe let go of that because <laughs> you're, you know, that, that parent steps in and goes, yeah, that's not happening right now. I'm really sorry, but you know, let's move on now. And the Artemisia has such a good way of helping kind of soothe that that kid part that's so darn mad that this just didn't work the way he or she wanted. Um, I think that that's, it's very useful. The, the other one that I use quite a bit is the mountain wormwood from the Alaskan essences. And that has this quality of Jane Bell talks about it as, as releasing the worms of discontent, you know, those, yeah. those <laughs> frustrations. <laughs> and, you know, once again, we get into this kind of, temper tantrum kind of thing. This is not what I wanted. This isn't what, what my plan was. And it helps to kind of move those out and you don't have to fight them so much. Yeah, that's really, that's interesting. The, um, the wormwood I work with is Artemisia absinthium, the classic uh, European wormwood that was, you know, used to make absinthe, but really it has the long history of being a digestive bitter and a digestive tonic, um, and, and being used to clear the body from worms and parasites. And so energetically, it's really got that clearing, you know, I, I like to think of it as psychic scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the energy that I, yeah, that I feel with it. It really, um, clears that stuck energy, like polishing, you know, our, our, our chakras, so sort to of speak. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really good image for it. You know, that, yeah. that, mugwort that has that, you know, if you think about it, sort of silvery in the moonlight and it has that quality of clarity, you know, it, it's when everything's kind of dry and grungy, you can really see how clear and bright and shiny it is. And it, it maybe works inside in that sort of really, it's a powerful kind of an herb. Right. <laughs> and all the Artemisias are, it's really one of my favorite plant families. I mean, there's, not just the sense of power and healing power. And, uh, you know, there's also sort of a sense of magic with all of them, especially the mugworts. But back to the wormwood, um, you know, it also deals with chaos and helping us to feel at ease in chaos. And so, you know, I, I think the lesson is if we don't fight it or have fear, then 
being in chaos is as natural as being in anywhere, being anywhere else. And so I think that goes along with some of your messages about um, not accepting, you know, things and learning to accept them. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, you know, a part of this overarching pattern of the Artemisia family. And the one that, that the next piece that I'm thinking of is the sagebrush, which it's not a sage, it's from the Flower Essence Society. Um, they make uh, Artemisia tridentata and, and, and have it under the name of sagebrush. And what it really speaks to is this passing away of what was, what was, you know, what the old ways of being, you know, our old conceptions of self, our old ways that we used to live and really letting it go for whatever's coming and whatever's coming may not be as big and grand and whatever as it might've been, but it's important to release what the old pattern was because it's, it's dead. You're, you're trying to hang on to dead leaves and you really need to let those go because they're just holding you down. Yeah. And I have a similar, um, I have the Artemisia Californica and it's a similar energy. Um, the, so the native California sage, sage brush and you know, this it's, it's such a lovely plant. It's got that sil the silvery foliage, but it's very soft. It's very different leaf pattern than the mugworts and wormwoods that we've been talking about. It's uh, kind of soft and fuzzy, you know, so it, um, it has a sense of softness and flexibility, yet it is so strong. And the, the aroma is just incredible. It smells so good. What I think it teaches us, um, you know, it has this sort of crone energy that it's ancient and wise <laughs> and witnesses the cycles of life, death and rebirth. But, you know, she's like seen it all, but knows how to survive. So it taps into the strength and helps like when we've suffered a loss or a hardship and feeling like we're left bare, California Sage Breast gives us the courage to, to face it. And at the same time, helps us shed that, you know, the, the ego while cleansing our perception so that we can see clearly what's in front of us and give courage to what must be done. So that's really another favorite of mine. I think it's really interesting the, the correlations it has with the other sagebrush, which I haven't work, worked with. Yeah, they they you know they uh, everybody in the same botanical family has a lot of um, overlap and a lot of they speak of the same message. I think it's always really interesting to sort of study laterally within a plant family. It's it's always very interesting to to have those experiences of what each one does within that botanical family and seeing where there's that that harmony, where's the similarity, and then also where are the special qualities that each one might have, which makes it really appropriate to, to use them with clients. This particular one is the one that's resonating with what's going on with you right now versus one of the others. So it's really nice to have a broad um, swath of different essences to work with. The piece that I think that maybe is next is that not just the releasing piece, but also the releasing mentally of what was the past. Um, you know, there's a, there's a tendency sometimes to be excessively past focused and not being able to kind of release what was, what was a previous way of life, what was a previous situation in order to move forward. And I think that honeysuckle is one that I think is really important essence and maybe doesn't get quite as much airtime <laughs> as some of the other essences do. Honeysuckle is one that Dr. Bach created, and it's all about taking your eyes off of the past, off of that, that, that rose-tinted glasses of everything was perfect back then when whatever time that was, you know, whatever age you were or whatever situation it was, and helping you to recognize that was your past, but not to live in it. Uh, to be able to move forward with some enthusiasm or, or positivity towards your future rather than spending all of your time really brooding on, on what you had in the past. Yeah, I think honey, I think you're right. Honeysuckle is under, underused. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. Um, it's, 
I've worked with the the Moro's honeysuckle, which is one of my Flora of Asia essences. And it has even more of a piece of that letting go of that letting go of attachment. The, the plant itself grows in, in a really shrubby little form and it just won't drop anything. The flowers hang on for ages after they're dead and little stems hang on forever. And I think this is kind of part of a honeysuckle thing as well, because if you think of the Japanese honeysuckle, you know, if you look underneath those top leaves, it's just a scruffy little mess underneath there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a piece of the, the honeysuckle signature is hanging on to things a little bit too long, a lot too long perhaps. And so the Maros is, has that element of, of helping you release what is really not serving you anymore. And I think that's a piece of the fall energy is, is looking at what to keep looking at what to let go of. Yeah, absolutely. And there's this sense of balance, you know, the balancing act of fall, uh, again, looking at flowers that are blooming in this time, I think they really show us the qualities that we can cultivate right now. And that, that, um, that quality of, of balance I see with the California poppy, which is still blooming. And, you know, we've talked about that before. It's a nice one for stress um, uh, that we, that we talked about in the stress episode. So the real lesson with that, the one is that balance between activity and rest as shown by the, the flower, how it opens for the sunlight and closes when there's, you know, when the sun goes away. So it's always opening and closing every day and, um, and resting and opening, you know, it, it gives us that clue that we need to do the same thing not burn the candle at both ends, like we tend to do, especially in the summer when it's, you know, when the days are light for so long. So as the light starts to get um, less and less in fall, going to autumn equinox where the days and nights are roughly equal. And then after the autumn equinox, there's more um, dark than there is light in a given 24 hour period. So California poppy, you know, helps us get back into that cycle. So we're just not constantly on the go, go, go. Um, and I, I feel like that's a really good one for this time of year. Yeah, if I recall correctly, I think that was the first essence that Richard Katz made ah. at the very early days of the Flower Essence Society. And, you know, I think that if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, what he was talking about was that, you know, his desire, his, 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 inherent motivations were always really expansive and the California poppy helped him become more grounded, become more, you know, pie in the sky, <laughs> everything's way out there and help California poppy sort of helps to ground those elevated spiritual notions into actual real life, 3d living here, reality kind of land. That's neat. I hadn't heard that story. What was the I first essence you made just to off topic? I'm curious. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, the first one that I ever made alone was a type of iris. Oh, and nice. I, that, yeah, it's, um, it's always fun to think back at the first essence you made. That was, that was such a long time ago, <laughs> but irises are really always about creativity. So they're, they're often a good choice for, not that I chose it, but it chose me for a first essence. And you? Queen Anne's Lace. Wild, wild carrot. Yeah. She definitely chose me. <laughs> that is the funny part of this journey yeah. of, of, of making essences and working with essences, the different ones that, that, that call us in. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to, we'll have to talk more about our, our experiences like that. Definitely. Yeah. That'd be a fun topic. <laughs> I like that Serato a lot. <laughs> Serato I, haven't, was I haven't made an essence with that. Well, Serato, uh, it's, it's one of the Bach essences. Um, and it was, it was one of the first essences that I made at the garden um, for the flora of Asia it, because it's really intriguing. Dr. Bach made, for the most part, made plants that were native or native to Europe, um, you know, English, English natives or commonly grown in Europe. And when he made the Serato, you know, looking at Julian Barnard's research on the Serato there could only have been a very few of them in England at all 
but for some reason he was so profoundly drawn to it that he made something that was really quite rare and it was only growing in a garden or two in England because it had just only recently been brought to England from the Himalayas. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's it's native. <laughs> it's way its native range is it, the Himalayas, Tibet, uh, and and parts of China. So when I when I first started going to this garden with all these plants that grow in China, having the Serato there was was a bit of a bridge between yeah, and, you know, Dr. Bach. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about the Quarry Hill Botanical Gardens in yeah. Sonoma, California. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a special place. Yeah. And and Serato is just such a special essence. It it really helps to connect your soul parts into your body. Because what happens in the negative pattern with Serato is you end up going around and asking for advice from everyone. <laughs> you never, you're just, you ask one person and you get maybe good advice or maybe not. And then you can just go to the next person, the next person, the next person. You wind up going in a circle. You know, you're just, you're, you're around and around and you never come to a decision place. And what Serato helps you do is to recognize that the answers are not outside of you. You need to stop asking. <laughs> Maybe you can get good advice from certain people if you're selective, but most of the time, the answers to what you're seeking are only within you. And to connect to your, your inner knowing is what the gift of Serato is. And for me to be able to bridge that by having, by, by connecting to Serato, um, you know, in that long lineage, it was really beautiful to really recognize, oh yes, I am really being guided. I am really doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing here. And Serato, I think that once again, it's one of those that doesn't get, it's, it's kind of a hard sell because most of the time, if you recommended Serato for somebody, they're just going to go and ask somebody else, what's the essence for them? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really difficult, but there's just something really special about that particular rest. Yeah. And I had only think probably learned recently that it was not a uh, European plant, which I probably assumed because of it being part of the Bach line this whole time. Right. And he had, he, he said in his notes, I believe that, that he had been looking for an alternative for that, for that essence, ah, but wasn't able found to find one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, there's, there's some interesting pieces of, of that when we're thinking about universality, that yeah. the, the habitat of the planet is a shared habitat with all of us and there are gifts and lessons and essences from all around the world, whatever habitats there might be. There's something really special, even if it's maybe not your home habitat. You're right. Exactly. And that, of course, happens here with, you know, invasive plants and that are, you know, not native California plants. And we have quite a few of them along our roadsides and everywhere, <laughs> the brooms and the, yeah. um, even though, even the wild carrot, even though it's been naturalized and there is like a, a smaller native uh, version of it and they're all kind of mixed up in the, in this area. <clears throat> but that, uh, so, you know, that just, grows everywhere. And what that really forced me to do when I first started making essences and working with the plants was really learn that APACA family really well. (laughs) Because of course, it's the one with poison hemlock and other um, treacherous, you know, genus and species. Yeah, that would be a fun topic to, to cover at some point. That that whole family because it, it really does run the gamut yeah. um, of you know wonderful, incredible medicinals and also pretty darn toxic. So you should know what you're doing when you're, when yeah. you're doing sort of harvesting. Got to get uh, really good at that family that plant identification, but yeah, Queen Anne's lace, it, I could go on on and on about it. It's another one that also, well, so many plants show us the, you know, the, the life cycle are, you know, the life cycle of birth and um, maturation, growth, and then decline and death and seeding. And, uh, you know, right on the Queen Anne's Lace flower stock, it, um, you know, has this umbrella kind of flower cluster. And then as they turn into seeds, there's umble, there's an umble underneath the flower that kind of turns into a birdcage kind of container 
and the flower closes up and it protects its seeds. It's really, it's really a neat um, cycle to watch. And nothing else is quite like that that I know of the flower wise, the way that it um, cages its seed head. And I just harvested a whole bunch of them from a, from a plant that I'm growing here. Um, but it's, uh, you know, another, just, just watching that, that life cycle and the seeds for the next, the next generation, the annual and the biannual plants give us that information. You know, well, every, color. every plant really does have that, have those qualities if we're watching mm -hmm. um, and if we sort of rewild ourselves, if we, if we reintroduce ourselves to nature, we recognize that one day is not like the next. And we are part of this cycle. We're part of this ecosystem and we don't stay the same. We, we, we are not static. We we're always shifting and changing and aging and nature helps us do that more gracefully helps us connect to that part of ourselves that, you know, we're not 20 anymore. Hopefully some of our listeners are 20 and they're getting on this journey early but we're all going down this trajectory and eventually we're going to be biodegrading <laughs> and the plants help us to release, you know, these, these concepts of what was appropriate and useful back then, but maybe isn't now. And I think that that piece of adapting to change is really a piece that that's highlighted this, this season. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there some essences? I have a few thoughts on, on this, this concept of, balance and decisiveness and, and embracing change, I think that it's, it's really worthwhile to, to meditate on this a little bit this season, because we're, we're looking at this releasing and dropping down in. Um, and I think that it's, it's something that's, it runs very counter to the culture, right? Mm -hmm. In the culture, we're supposed to look exactly the same forever, <laughs> as much as possible, right? You know, maintain that youthful appearance and, you know, no wrinkles and no anything. We're supposed to pretend that we never change or look any different and that, you know, uh, economically our culture is like, we need to be making more money all the time, always making more, always, you know, being more productive, always being more growth oriented. And yet there's these inherent seasons to things. And if we're always fighting the season, we're really doing our, our own bodies and our energetic systems sort of a disservice because we're constantly fighting the flow of things. I, I like to think about the essences as being aids to getting us in flow. And sometimes the flow is expansive and wild, and sometimes it's more thoughtful and quiet and, and going inward. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I I agree. Again, with the when the light starts changing and the days start getting shorter in the fall, you know, the most the biggest complaint I hear, you know, people, um, you know, miss having the daylight being, um, you know, miss having the daylight, and that's actually what, you know, why so many people are in favor of of daylight savings time as we practice it here and they don't want to turn the clocks back in the fall. Of course, I think <laughs> we should not have daylight savings. I think it just should be standard time uh, throughout that change is makes, makes everything, makes the change that we're going through that daylight savings uh, back and forth uh, change um, makes it even harder on our bodies. And it's shown to have an increased accidents and workplace, you know, traffic accidents and workplace accidents. But back to your point is that it's related to, you know, wanting to be up and out all the time, wanting to be active all the time. The, the concept of youth, you know, fall, autumn is used as an idiom for, you know, the autumn of someone's life for aging. And, and then winter is akin to death. And nobody in this culture you know, wants to face that, uh, you know, we don't want to age and we don't want to die. And we think that we're, <laughs> you know, uh, going to live forever. I think that, that people have trouble accepting the seasonal shift because we have trouble accepting our own mortality and it is, you know, on a deeper level. Exactly. It's, it's really kind of a soul sickness. And I think we covered this a little bit when we talked about grief, that, that process of of no one is comfortable with anybody being around anybody who's grieving. It's it, we just want it to go away. Just make it 
<laughs> make it invisible and make it go away. Make it never happen. I'm never going to die. I never want to face anybody else dying. So I don't go to funerals, right? <laughs> it's that mindset of, of that. That's just, we just don't want to think about it, look at it, talk about it, be with it at all. And I think yes. that it's something worthwhile to become more friendly with perhaps and, and have a little bit more affiliation with. And this is a natural season to think about those things. It it is. And I I definitely agree with a good, it's a good time to really just sit with these changes in a meditative way. um, However, that looks for you and being, learning how to just be present with it. Yeah. And the next, the, the piece that I'm thinking of next is, is sort of being something that if I was working with somebody and this was, this was really up for them, this, this whole premise was up and some of these essences that we've talked about already get folded into a formula. I think that, that we can really use that encouragement of, of that, that fortitude and strength because it's pretty easy to lose momentum, to lose you know, because this going inward process can feel very passive and, and can feel, you know, tiring or, or something along those lines. But there, there needs to be countered by this, this uprising inner strength, this, this fortitude. And I think oak is, is a natural fit for that because it has that inherently strong quality. And really any of the trees fit into that category. I think that looking at maybe something like a blackberry would also be useful because it meets those two places. It meets that sort of that, that inward going with a heartfulness, with um, an open hearted enthusiasm and endurance. I think that that would be useful. And then one of the other pieces, I think of clematis also for this type of scenario, because clematis is really helpful for, helping us get grounded and present the clematis type tends to want to be really dreamy and sort of like, if I'm not doing anything that I'm just going to be laying here and fantasizing about whatever it might be, but not actually engaging. And this energy of fall requires engagement. It requires us to make decisions. It requires us to say, yep, letting this go. Yep you know, cleaning out my closet. Yep. Changing out for, for my sweaters or whatever it is, but that requires a certain engagement, even as we are feeling those feelings of kind of that heaviness or grief or release or sadness. So there's that tension between those two poles of that active energy of, of bringing in the harvest or letting something go. And then also in that energy of coming inward and downward. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that that the two poles um, of ener- you know, of the energy and the fortitude and strength you, that you kind of need to sort of muster up to deal with what needs to be dealt with this time of year, and part of that's getting ready for harsher times. I mean, even if we don't live in a harsh climate, I think it's in our in our DNA, <laughs> yeah. especially those of us with ancestry of, of harsher climates, you know, for me, I think the European and the Northern ancestry, you know, I've grown up in California my entire life. I've never lived in snow, but I feel like going into winter, I have to prepare for something. You know? Your ancestors are saying, get ready now, <laughs> but winter is coming, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, Game of Thrones meme really resonated. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, Blackberry is perfect for that. Blackberry is got so much strength. It just, it's finished its um, fruiting by now. Um, but the, you know, the the vines, they keep growing. You know, we have to cut them down a lot on this property and it doesn't matter what time of year it is they you know they just keep right on growing and so they have a sense of there's a sense of persistence they just are doing their thing and they're going to keep doing it and it's you know a matter of um you know accepting that but also on the flip side as you're talking about that sense of acceptance i you know i like the cats here the the hypocarus reticata 
as an essence to just really help be present. And again, going back to kind of that meditation for this time of year and that flower really helps us hold intention and shine our light just to show up and be present. And it helps our, increase our own energy field. So when we feel like the sun energy dwindling, that doesn't mean our, you know, our own personal spiritual kind of energy field needs to, to also dwindle. We just, we just need to access it. Yeah. I, as we kind of come to this place of, of, of embracing the fall, I think that we've talked about a lot of essences that, that really speak to these qualities um, of, you know, aspecting aspects of grief, aspects of adaptation and releasing and, and preparing, you know, with that strength uh, of, of moving into the winter. We've covered a lot of different bases and a lot of different aspects. And I think that, that even just, I, I like what we're doing about thinking about seasons and what's blooming now and the pieces of, of your environment around calling to you at this time of year, what plants are in your ecosystem that are preparing for fall or doing their thing in fall. A lot of them are really blooming right now, like the asters um, and the artemisias. So I think that it's it's worthwhile to just spend some time in nature this time of year and, and look and watch at what's going around and admire the berries and the different leaves that are changing and the different, the way the ecosystem is preparing for fall. And that can really advise you on, on inner preparations for fall as well. Yeah. And, and not just, you know, I love looking at the, the plants that are uh, preparing, like losing their leaves or the plants that are um, dropping their seeds and their acorns, the plants that are flowering, but even the plants, just the evergreens, you know, that are not really changing too much. I mean, even the redwoods lose, lose some leaves uh, during this time of year. But even, even the, you know, the evergreens have a message in that uh, not only can we survive the seasons, we can thrive. And I like to just, yeah, have that as sort of a, a constant. It's our constant, you know, through the changes. Exactly. There's a steadiness to it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's that eternal and solid and grounded and also prepared for, for whatever comes. And I think that that's a, a beautiful thing to have in any formula is having an evergreen tree mm -hmm. that really helps to bring in that quality of, of, you know, fortitude. Yeah. Love it. Beautiful. So I think we'll bring it together at this point. Um, I think that we've really covered quite a bit of ground and, and this meditation on fall and the meaning of the season and the different plant allies and aspects that we can come together with nature in harmony with nature and taking care of ourselves as well. Yeah. And what a great conversation once again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. You've been listening to the Flower Essence Podcast with Urkana Feld and Kathleen Aspens, and we appreciate your interest in connecting with nature on a deeper level. You can find us online at theflowerescencepodcast.com or join us on Facebook and continue the discussion. This podcast is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are not physicians and do not diagnose, prescribe, or treat medical conditions. Please consult with your own physician or healthcare practitioner regarding the suggestions and recommendations made by the hosts and guests of the Flower Essence Podcast. <laughs>